Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Simon Montgomery, and I'm the Regional Director of Movers and Shakers. Uh, welcome to our second Movers and Shakers event in this series of four in collaboration with Stockport Council and Stockport Mayoral Development Corporation for today's event, Delivering Regeneration and Residential Development Sustainably. For those of you who don't know Movers and Shakers, we have been running first-class property and construction events for over 25 years, bringing together key players from public and private sectors. And the Movers and Shakers' big initiative for 2021 uh, and, and indeed for 2022 is to drive more and better public and private sector collaboration locally and indeed globally, something I feel like we have an abundance here today. Uh, firstly, a big thank you to our sponsors today, Rise Homes. Uh, thank you also for the excellent video on the mailbox development in Stockport. Rise Homes, who are formerly known as Housing Capital Property, uh, is a company based in Stockport that has specialised in the development of sustainable residential property, all for rent since 2012. The company has developed close to a thousand houses and apartments across seven schemes in the north of England. Uh, they have developed, uh, also developed five biomass heating systems. And its tribe apartment scheme completed in 2015 won the prestigious global award for, resident, for a residential scheme from Bream, which is a press, uh, an impressive accolade indeed. And it's onwards and upwards for Rice Homes, uh, who have got five further developments in progress, which will deliver an additional 750 apartments, over 500, 500 of which will benefit from renewable energy. And we thank them for, for their support today. So on to today, uh, the second in the series of four, uh, delivering regeneration and resident, residential development sustainably. With COP26 in Glasgow later this month, and with COP goals in mind is why we generated today's uh, theme. Uh, there are plenty of questions that come out uh, with reference to that. How do we collectively deliver sustainably in regeneration and residential development to meet the ambition of carbon neutrality? Uh, what are the barriers to this and how can they be overcome? How does this fit with changing lifestyles, particularly post-pandemic? And will customers be the real driver to ensuring uh, this happens? Uh, it's a great topic. It's a relevant topic uh, with so many questions. Um, and I shall lead you on to the panel uh, today. So many thanks to the panel. So to Lord Deben, who is the chairman of the Climate Change Committee. Joe Holden, Sustainability Director at Peel. Mike Wilton is the director and the leader of the Manchester office for Arup. Mike is also the chair of the Climate Change Partnership in Manchester. Nigel Rawlings is the CEO of Rise Homes Limited. And our chair today is Helen Gribben, who is the director of Renaissance Associates. Uh, and I think you'll all agree that is an exciting uh, mix of contributors. A very quick overview. Uh, in, a, in not too much time, I shall hand you over to Lord Kerslake, who would like to say a few words of welcome and thanks. Uh, and from the Lord Kerslake's introduction, uh, he will hand us over to the panellists who I have just referred to. Please don't forget to ask questions. Um, there is on your, um, on your platform, there is a questions tab. Those questions will be forwarded to Helen, um, who, has, as I mentioned, is chairing today's event, and she will field those as and when appropriate. Thank you. Uh, without further ado, I should like to hand you over to Lord Kerslake, who would kick start today's session. Lord Kerslake, over to you, and thank you. Well, thank you very much, Simon, and a very warm welcome uh, from me. As chair of the Stockport Merrill Development Corporation, uh, we've been established by uh, the Mayor of Greater Manchester, Andy Burnham, and Stockport Council uh, to create in the western half of the town centre uh, the Greater Manchester's newest, uh, greenest and coolest neighbourhood. So that's our role and one of the things we wanted to do was to have a series of events uh, like this one today to address some of the key issues that, that we all share, if you like, uh, in this challenge. Uh, as Simon said, this is the second Movers and Shakers event that we've done. It's in a series of four, uh, and we do it as Stockport MDC and indeed with Stockport Council. Uh, the theme, as you've heard, is about sustainability, if you like. A key goal for the MDC, if we are to live up to our ambition to be uh, the greenest as well as the newest neighbourhood uh, in Greater Manchester. I'm a passionate believer in this agenda, and in particular, I'm passionate about the role of the property industry uh, in making this happen. Uh, it's got to be a collaboration between government and the sector itself, and the sector has a lot to offer in terms of influencing the solutions, uh, and that's really what we want uh, to debate today. 
uh, you've got a terrific panel ahead of you, I think, uh, discussing this. Uh, and I think they bring a lot of practical expertise as well as passion for the agenda. So with no further ado, I'll hand over to uh, the chair for this event, Helen Gribben. Thank you, um, Lord Kerslake. And um, yeah, an exciting uh, session ahead. Um, it's, a, it's not a very long time to uh, talk through what is a, a very big subject. So um, without further ado, we'll start with our question and, and present the first one to Lord uh, Deben. Um, Lord Deben, would you uh, kindly explain uh, to um, everyone the work of the Climate Change Committee and um, uh, what its work in what its his work in this space of regeneration, please? Well, happy to do that. The Climate Change Committee was set up under the Climate Change Act some 11 or 12 years ago, which was passed by Parliament by an all-party majority with only eight voting against it. And it was the creation of an all-party group. It was the uh, Conservatives in opposition um, and all the opposition parties with a, a huge amount of support from right across the port and then saying to the government this is really something that the whole of parliament should do and so the government introduced the bill which became an act so we start from an all-party um, agreement and that means that the climate change committee is entirely independent it consists of uh, eight or nine uh, leading scientists or uh, economists uh, I'm the only one who doesn't fit into that as the chairman, and I'm appointed not by the government, but by the minister uh, in charge of climate change, by the first minister of Scotland, first minister of Wales, and the first minister of the North of Ireland. So um, it makes you pretty independent because that's four different political parties. I was elected, chosen by a, a Liberal Democrat in the coalition government, a Scottish nationalist, a, a Welsh socialist, and a Protestant unionist, and they got a Conservative and a Catholic as the um, um, as the chairman. So I, I, it's a very useful and absolute in, independent position to be. And what we do is, first of all, we set the uh, targets. We set the budgets sector by sector for five year periods. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and those are then presented to Parliament. Parliament then uh, turns those into law. And so far they've done that, all six of them, the last one just uh, at the turn of the year. Um, and that means that we now have budgets which take us right the way forward to, uh, to 2038. Um, and by the time we get there, of course, we'll be within spinning distance of the net zero target of 2050. We'll know exactly where mm -hmm. you just draw a straight line to that. And, and these, once they are passed by Parliament, can't be changed without the Climate Change Committee's agreement. Now, the whole purpose of that is that it makes sure that you bring together the two different timescales, which are so important. First of all, there's the democratic timescale, which is that every four or five years, uh, you have to renew the democratic mandate. But the other time scale is the one of climate change, which is out of our hands, i.e. we've actually got to go on fighting it and you can't have it changed every five years. Mm. And by doing this, it gives the parliament the, the, the duty and the right and the important duty of um, actually making the law. But once the law is made, everyone knows that it won't be changed. And of course, that's very important for business because then business knows that this is the, these are the parameters. There are not many things that I've been a businessman all my life, except when I was a minister. Um, there are not many things that are certain in business, but this is certain. We do know that that is the program. So it does make it possible for you to make decisions which you wouldn't otherwise be able to make. Hmm. And so then every year, the um, Climate Change Committee um, measures what the government has done against what the budget uh, is supposed to be and um, uh, we do it actually now uh, department by department which means that you can keep the feet to the fire in the way that you really want to so you can say well the department of justice should have done this and hadn't done it um, and of course if at some stage it became clear that the government wasn't actually doing what the law said it should 
then, of course, it could be taken to court. We wouldn't do it. Somebody else would take them to court. But I fear I'd be the first witness for the prosecution in those circumstances. So I'm mm -hmm. trying very hard to make sure the government doesn't put me in that position. So that, that, that's how we, how we do it. Now, all the way along the line, of course, we have to show um, how you can achieve these things. It's not for us to lay that down, but we have to show that it can be done. And then if the government isn't doing it, point out the things that they have to do if they're going to reach these. Now, there are very often choices that they have to make, although those choices get narrower and narrower as you move on. But it is for us to make sure that not only they do it, but that, 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 that we've really tested out um, what has to be done. So the biggest thing that's happened recently is that um, government said to us, can we, after the uh, agreement in, in Paris, the absolutely earth-changing agreement in Paris six years ago, government then asked, can we reach net zero? And very recently we produced the, the answer to that was, yes, we can. Uh, we can do it by uh, we can't do it earlier than 2050, but we can do it by 2050. And what's more, we can do it at a reasonable cost, the cost being um, less than 1% of our gross national product every year. So there's no reason why we can't do it. That's well within our ability. Um, and, and we've done those fig that figuring very, very carefully indeed. And it's internationally recognized as the best work that has been done in this area. So whatever you read in the newspapers about this or that person arguing this or that way, that there is, there is a real basis to all this and we really have done the work. Um, and uh, having done that, uh, then of course we say, uh, of course, although it isn't going to cost beyond our abilities, it will fall in different ways. So there will be some people who will have to be helped so that this is a fair transition from where we are, where we have to be. And the fairness of the transition is crucial, not just for one's moral views and political views, but actually because of one's um, view, views of, uh, of, of what can be done. Because if we don't do it fairly, it won't be done. I mean, it either has to be done fairly or people won't go along with it. We, we're very clearly that kind of nation. So that is what we're waiting for from the Treasury. And it's a very odd sort of argument that's been going on while this is being done, because it, the Treasury is producing something which explains what it is going to do about the problems. So, of course, it's going to have a lot of problems in it, because that's what we've asked it to do. Mm. And what we've asked is not that we say, well, we can't do it because of the problems. We've got to think about how we deal. We do a green deal, in effect. I mean, that's what yes. we have to do. And that is where we, uh, we, we uh, press now. It, it is on three things. First of all, action. The government has now done a great deal to fill in the parameters. It's its latest um, uh, statements on the uh, building strategy and all that is very, very helpful indeed. It's, it's put into a, a framework, but that framework has then has to be acted on. And we as a committee will be keeping its feet to the fire, if I put it like that, in order that it will actually act on those things. Second thing is to make sure that it acts in a way which doesn't disadvantage some sections of the population. We really do have to make sure that that happens. And the third thing, of course, is to make our contribution to the international situation. We, we are the leaders. That is certainly true in our ambition. We're not yet the leaders in our action, but we are in our ambition. And we, um, uh, in that sense, then have to got, uh, get other people on board. There are now 15 uh, or more climate change committees copying our system. They're not quite the same, each one, but we now have a, an international agreement between us all. And they come from all sorts of countries, from Chile, from Finland. Um, and we've just, uh, we've just been discussing with the Spanish. They're about to set theirs up. The French have got it. So it, it's, all, it's all beginning to grow around the, around the world. And we share our understandings one to another, even though we are differently founded. Indeed. Independence is the crucial thing. Now, regeneration. Um, is absolutely a part and parcel of what we're about, because at the heart of our problem, if you like, is where we are, um, because we, we do have a very large number of buildings, which we will have in 2050. Um, mm. And on the way between those, we've got to do something about their heating and their ventilation. I mean, just take the extreme example, 
um, offices that have been turned into flats not only are uh, very often not uh, heated in a proper way because they um, uh, are heated by fossil fuels, but they also aren't ventilated properly. And indeed, some of them are just unlivable in during the summers that we have now. Well, when you think of those summers being hotter and hotter, which is what we're going to have, you really have to make those changes for, for human reasons, not just mm. uh, the direct, uh, the, 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 the fighting of climate change. So at the heart of what we're doing is saying that we've got to retrofit our present uh, buildings and that is part of our regeneration, much better done in the course of the regeneration. We have to build only according to systems which will meet net zero. This government, uh, I mean, governments have been, a conservative government in 2017 did a terrible thing, which was to stop the net zero house build, house situation. House builders in general have behaved appallingly because they have not stepped up to the mark and they have been building a million houses which are not fit for the future. Mm. And what that means is that they have been handing the cost of that change, which is very cheap if you're doing it from the beginning. But if you don't do it from the beginning, it then has to be retrofitted, which is much more expensive. And the, the house builders have handed on that cost to the purchasers. I think this is a real disgrace, particularly mm. when in the meantime, they have made profits, which would certainly have made it possible for them to have done this job properly. So we really do have to have a change. The government is going to do this by 2024, 25. I'm sorry, we don't do it more quickly, perhaps incrementally up to there, but we really do have to start recognizing that everything we build, everything we do has in fact to be ready for net zero. Indeed, yeah. Generation, that becomes a central bit of what we do when we regenerate our cities. And I say yeah. that with great pleasure sure. because I was, I was born in Stockport, so I have a particular interest in making sure that Stockport gets this right. Indeed. No, that, that's uh, usually, there's quite a number of points there that I think we'll pick up on on, on, the, on the wider discussion. So thank you for that. And um, Mike, in terms of um, your work as the chair of the Manchester Climate Change Partnership, um, you know, you're, uh, that partnership are committed to uh, reducing the carbon emissions by at least 50% by 2025, which is a, an ambitious target. Could you um, sort of explain to us how this is being looked at and what you're doing uh, as, a, as a partnership to achieve this? Thank you very much, Helen. Um, so the Manchester Climate Change Partnership, let me explain a bit about what that is, first of all. It brings together the public, the private and the voluntary sectors and they are organisations in the city that directly represent about 20% of the city's emissions, but obviously have an indirect impact for greater than that. And they've all come together with the principle they're all committed to climate action and they want to work collaboratively with each other to achieve climate action. So it's a really great basis to start and it brings together that partnership of different organisations. I'm really proud to share an organisation that includes both um, uh, members of Friends of the Earth and Manchester Airports Group and having a sensible, civilised, informed conversation about aviation emissions in that forum I think is a great opportunity for people to work together in partnership collectively. What we've done is worked with the Tyndall Centre at the University to think about what Manchester's role is in the meeting the UK's uh, Paris Agreement emissions and set out our trajectory of where we need to go as a city to achieve that. And what we do is we monitor every year how we're doing against that progress. So actually this week we've just launched our annual report and there's a lot of really positive things in there about what we're doing. Um, um, we're doing work in communities, a programme called In Our Nature, working at the grassroots in places like Moss Side, how we can work with communities, community fridges, loads of good initiatives around there to help get action at community level. We're working with Greater Mentor and actually the C40 organisation of cities about how to best collaborate with businesses so that we can work with businesses and the great role business can play in achieving climate action. We're collaborating on transport, we're collaborating with the building sector around retrofit, and I'm particularly picking up uh, Lord Deben's comment about uh, new build, 
We're really pleased over the summer we worked with Rebuilding Council and sort of the youth Manchester property industry to make a recommendation to Manchester City Council that all new buildings in the city need to be zero carbon. And again, we feel that's a really important step forward. And I really welcome what Lord Deven has said about that. Um, however, the bad news is our, our annual missions last year that covered the period of lockdown, we still did not reduce our emissions sufficiently, even in lockdown, to meet our trajectory. So Manchester is not reducing its emissions quick enough. That's not saying Manchester is doing a bad job. That's common in many cities across the UK, but more action is needed. So our next step is that we're currently working to look at a detailed framework, looking at all of Manchester's emissions and trying to say what we can do in each one of those emissions. Some of them might be working with government, some might be action by individual members, some might be collaboration across other cities in the UK. But we're trying to pull together that broad list of all our emissions on what we need to do going forward. So picking up again on Lord Demon's comment about action, that's absolutely where we're at. We've got some nice policies in place. We've got a great partnership in place. We really need to transition through to action to actually achieve some really serious carbon emissions reduction because we're not quite there doing that enough yet. Excellent. Thank you, Mike. Um, I think there's possibly an acoustic issue there, Mike, if you could just um, check, check on that, if that's OK. But, um, uh, Joe, um, over to yourself. Um, you're you're uh, part of the Peel Group and um, you're the first sort of property company to achieve a net zero carbon status uh, using the UK Green Building Council's uh, 29 def 2019 definition of, um, uh, uh, of for buildings in the UK. And uh, one of your sustainability principles is to put more back into the natural environment than you take out. Um, how are you um, as an organisation delivering this ambition? Thank you, Helen. Um, and hi, everybody. Nice to see you all today. Um, Yes, really. I think as a you know, we we talked heard about action and and delivery. And I suppose for for Peel Land and Property, we really are on the the, the delivery end of this. Um, and and so it's 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 a, a privilege and a big responsibility to make sure that we are embedding um, um, action into everything we do. So I mean, over the last year, we've really looked at our environmental, social, and governance processes within the business to make sure that as early as possible in these processes, we're, we're building it in. And I think this is absolutely essential if you want to get net zero carbon, nature-based solutions, um, and any sustainability issues, it needs to be really embedded in your business model um, and to adopt it at the earliest stage possible so that it then flows through all of your activities that you're delivering. Um, so really, yeah, it's about the development process has been a, a vehicle for, for putting more nature-based solutions in place alongside um, net zero carbon activities. Um, for example, you know, with our um, large regeneration project on the Wirral, um, at Wirral Waters, you know, we, the first thing we did there was uh, we planted over 1500 trees um, to show the local people about the aspiration for the area to, to bring the green infrastructure along with all the other ambitions for, for net zero carbon, for regeneration, for bringing local communities along, also generating um, new communities at the same time. Um, and we feel that the green infrastructure element of that is, is really important to um, raise aspirations. Um, similarly, with our, our new home building division, North Stone, where we, we're just starting to deliver um, homes, new homes for families in Bolton, um, and really starting to reset the benchmark in terms of um, what house building means um, in the Northwest. Um, one of the first things we've done there is to create a, a sort of connecting communities with nature commitment, which is a nine point plan to ensure that all our landscape design code incorporates an extra 10% biodiversity with, within, the, within the plan. The homes are starting from scratch, have been very sustainably designed to ensure we, we use local sources, we reduce plastic wherever we can, uh, we reduce waste, we, we encourage a circular economy approach to that. Um, and, and so really it has to become part of your philosophy. 
um, if you're really going to embed it. And I think this comes back to the, the governance part of any, any business at the moment. Mm. If we're really going to step up to these challenges, um, you really just need to, to build it in. And that starts off with ensuring that sustainability isn't a bolt on to your, to your business model. It is actually fundamental to your business model. Um, mm. And we, we just recently um, um, approved, you know, um, seven top ESG KPIs uh, where it puts environmental and social considerations on a level with financial considerations. So going forward, this means that it, it's no longer just about that bottom line. It's about the triple bottom line of environmental, social and financial considerations. Because at the end of the day, it's about putting back in for local communities. We're, we're, we're developing um, new neighbourhoods in our re regeneration activities. We know they need to be net zero carbon. We know they need to be able to um, activate all the local ecosystem services in terms of making the area flood resilient, reduce um, uh, air, air emissions, uh, make sequestering more carbon, um, and actually providing more access to nature for if these local communities are, are going to thrive. Mm. Oh, thank you, Joe. Um, some interesting um, uh, initiatives being implemented there. Um, Nigel, um, we obviously heard from you earlier in the um, in the uh, uh, video of um, your development at the mailbox in uh, Stockport, um, and um, you know you have there one of the largest green walls in uh, the north of England, as as we saw. Um, it'd be interesting to hear from you uh, the decision making process behind this, but also the sustainability um, fit. Um, in your wider decision making. Um, Lord Deben touched on the, the need for um, uh, retrofitting, um, and that's something that was high on, on, on Joe's agenda there uh, from the Peel Group. But um, from, from RISE's perspective, um, would you like to sort of tell us a little bit more on that sort of broader, broader aspect? Um, as I said in the movie, and by the way, if anybody wants my services as an actor, I am available. Um, <laughs> the institutional investor market is demanding sustainability. Um, we, in fact, are owned by the British Strategic Investment Fund, and they invest in foreign forestry renewables, as well as um, affordable housing and um, through rise homes, market rental properties. Um, I originally um, was focused on heating here at the mailbox and wanted to, I went to cross to the leisure centre across the road and suggested to them that I could put a, a biomass district heating system in this building because we've got a large basement. It used to be the sorting office and lorries used to drive into the basement and then have a pipe across the station approach and heat the swimming pool. Unfortunately, I didn't really engage with the right people at the right level and that didn't gain traction. So I was delighted when POTS owners who are, are architects to secure, helped to secure planning on this building um gave us suggestions around the living wall um and it, you know it is a fantastic feature but we do focus very much on heating systems to cover a point that lord deben made also mechanical ventilation with heat recovery and it's just essential for the investor market but also it does help marketing to residents as well who are more and more in tune with you know renewable requirements um, the, the point about affordability is a difficult one. Renewable heat incentive, for example, has more or less expired now. Um, air source heat pumps are still very expensive. So we must just hope that the efficiency and cost of air source heat pumps improves as, as the volume grows. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, the, um, just to kind of follow on from that, um, uh, the um, in terms of green green infrastructure, um, for a town like Stockport, what um, and across and also across the UK, how can how can this be improved? Do you think? Well, Stockport um, is quite interesting, really, in that uh, everybody thinks the River Mersey is Liverpool's river, and. Um, um, we've had, uh, Joe mentioned, uh, Wirral Waters, 
But of course, the River, river Mersey starts in Stockport. It's hidden under the ground. And it's the confluence, if that's the right word, of the River Tame and the River Goit, which form, to, form the River Mersey in Stockport. It's not na navigable, and it's a great potential asset for Stockport. If we um, came up with a solution, say a two kilometre pipe underneath the river that we could div divert some of the water through, I think we could uh, provide energy to a lot of Stockport town centre. And I think things like that, which would primarily be a flood defence system for the Goit and the Tame Up River, would be a fantastic um, progression. And it, it would be a sort of unique and a, and a first for this country mm -hmm. if we could do something like that here in Stockport. Sounds exciting. Some uh, a nice challenge there for the engineers amongst us. Um, what, one of the questions from our, our um, uh, people watching today uh, is around um, timber, and it, it might be one for, for Joe or Mike here, um, to encourage the adoption of wood in construction um, more, more rapidly than, than it is and, and remove that stigma associated with timber in buildings. Um, Joe, Mike, do you have any thoughts on that? Do you want to go first, Mike? Okay. Is my sound a bit better this time? I've changed my headphones. Sorry about the noise before. That's good. Um, just as I think real future for timber and construction, I think it was sort of um, stigmatized. I think we're seeing increasingly some really interesting timber buildings coming forward that doesn't just actually use timber as a hidden part of it, actually, but expresses the timber. And there's lots of sort of almost like green infrastructure opportunities around more use in timber. So I think we're positive about it. It's part of the solution. There's gonna be part of the solution that's go around steel and concrete and how we understand and reduce the carbon emissions of those elements of the built environment. But mm. there is definitely an increasing use I'm seeing of timber in construction. I think that's welcome. It has its place, it's an important thing. It's not going to replace everything else we use as part of our toolkit. Yes, I'd agree. Joe, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, and I think really, you know, going back to what Nigel and Mike were saying um, in, in terms of interventions, but I think that first and foremost, we need to look at you know, the fabric of the buildings um, and, and make those buildings as, um, as insulated and as, as sustainable as possible so that we don't actually need a lot more heat, um, which, which would be the great thing. Um, but then in terms of the use of wood, yes, I mean, it has its challenges at the moment. Getting hold of enough timber at the moment is a real challenge in terms of supply chains. Mm. Um, we're, we're using uh, we, we use a lot of timber in our um, Northstone homes in, in Bolton. Um, retrofitting is maybe a, a more more challenging, and also you have to look at the whole life carbon um, cycle of of timber as well. Um, and I think this is a this is where we are at the moment because we, we're learning we're every, every week we're learning something new and you know in terms of the whole life um of of timber it's it's knowing um what what can you if you build that into a building what happens to it you almost have to make it so that you can deconstruct that building after it comes to the end of its life and make sure that those materials then can go back into into a sustainable source or be positively yeah. used again and especially with timber it's really important that you get that circular economy going and you consider that so that they can go back and get used in a different way which mm. really reduces uh, the carbon footprint of the timber in that case indeed lord even did you want to add something there uh, ju just that i think that this is part of a much bigger issue which is that if we're going to plant a lot more trees, which we need to do in order to take the carbon out of the atmosphere, we really do have to have a proper um, timber industry in a way which we haven't had up to now. And there's a great deal to be done in that way. I, there's to do with the regulations as far as timber in buildings are concerned. There's a great deal to be done by creating the kind of uh, supply chain, which Joe's just talked about, which is really important. But we do have to look at this end to end. This is really something which mm -hmm. is important um, on land use right the way through to regeneration. And like so many other things, this is a, a chain which we have to have to get right. And I suppose one of the things that we all need to do is to press home to the government the need 
to create the circumstances in which these chains can take place. It's a private enterprise operation, but unless you build the circumstances, unless you get the regulations right, unless you deal with the problems uh, from a government point of view, you don't get what we need, which is a timber industry from growing the trees to using them and therefore keeping the carbon in the building. That's why it's so important to use it. Because otherwise, if it goes into something where the carbon is just released, all you've done is to uh, retain it for 20, 30, 40 years, which is not actually what we want to do. Mm. No, just very, very valid. Um, thank you. Um, Mike, we, we touched on previously um, about retrofitting and, and um, uh, how we can deal with the challenge of retrofitting in, with regards to the climate emergency. And, and one of the, again, the questions from our uh, listeners or watchers is, um, is the cost of the retrofit too big? And, and do we end up with um, lower, a lower housing delivery as a result of that? Do you want to talk a little bit more about that, Mike? Yeah, thank you very much, Helen. It's a massive issue, and I think it's probably the most intractable, the, the, the area of our emissions that we've made the least progress. I think, as everyone said, most of the buildings that will be with us in 2050 are already built. Um, we certainly don't want to add any more buildings that we need to retrofit to our inventory, but we do need to address the ones we've got. I think there's some really interesting things happening around uh, commercial building retrofits in that market. I think we're seeing many more universities and those sorts of buildings and schools looking at how they can address it. The private house market is across Greater Manchester. We know the sort of streets of terraced houses, Victorian semis, mid, mid, mid war semis. How we're going to address those is a real challenge. Um, and the, art, the challenge is, I think, largely money. Um, we think it'll cost 20, 30,000 pounds to retrofit each house. And that's not a pot of money that's sitting on anyone's sort of um, inventories at the moment, any, any, anyone's balance sheets at the moment. How that is going to be afforded is a big challenge. Mm. I think just one part of the solution to that challenge, there's a great example I heard about on Monday at the Greater Manchester Green Summit, um, a housing association called, called Bolton at Home mm. have started a project where they are taking over, over a redundant um, shopping centre and turning it into a skill development zone where they can bring forward the skills and the technologies that they will then be implementing in their social housing retrofit program and that helps our social market program because we desperately need to get our skills and our market and our supply chains together to do that but also it starts to drive down the cost of retrofit as we get more people in the supply chain, more understanding of the things we need to do, and that will start to impact on the able to pay market so that we can spread that across. Mm -hmm. I'm slightly disappointed by what the government seems to have done on heat pumps. I see that as being a top-down um, approach that will help, but it's not the solution. I'm really hoping that we're going to hear much more from the government about how we're going to support retrofit of private sector housing and social housing, because that's going to be the thing that I think if we miss the target in 2050, I think it will be because we failed to grab the opportunity around domestic retrofit. Mm -hmm. No, it's a, it's a very valid point that I think um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very big area that we have to tackle. Um, and, um, you know, it, it, it is one area that probably um, might lend itself to a term that I've come across recently, which is um, or, or be a catalyst for a term uh, that I've heard recently called climate grief and despair. Um, so, um, yeah, we, it's what we can do through conversation, normalising this conversation to actually uh, help uh, us all to, to uh, um, work our way through that, that uh, grief and despair. Joe, you wanted to add something there? Yes, just as Mike said, it was the Greater Manchester Green Summit, uh, the fourth Green Summit uh, just on Monday. Yeah. Um, and at the first Green Summit, Andy Burnham announced uh, there would be a Greater Manchester Environment Fund, um, which, which would help to catapult um, um, 
sustainability in, in lots of different areas, um, nature-based solutions, but also I think this has great, got great potential for the retrofit sector as well. So mm. where, whereas, you know, we know it's expensive, we know, we know it's complicated, but through the Greater Manchester Environment Fund, it's a way of um, creating an economy of scale of the funding. Um, so instead of, make, you know, small um, piecemeal um, fun funding to smaller projects, we've got some really, really big issues within Greater Manchester that we need to address. And mm -hmm. it's only through a vehicle such as the Greater Manchester Environment Fund that you might be able to scale it up at a local level to be able to actually, you know, make, make a dent in, in the big retrofit um, issue that we all know is sort of looming like the, the, the elephant in the room. Yeah, yeah. No, that's very valid. I mean, it um, leads on to another kind of pertinent point in terms of that whole investment market and, and Mike um sorry Nigel it might be something that you yourself or uh Lord Deben want to comment on I mean the whole that whole investment um platform um you know is the, is there the potential that in the short term I know we've got long-term aims but in the short term could there possibly be a two-tier investment market uh, for those that, that are very much tuned into the necessity uh, and urgency of delivering sustainable development and those that, that, that quite frankly, don't, um, you know, be they, they, they sort of um, climate agnostics or, or whatever. Well, if that's aimed at me, I, I don't think you can have a two-tier system. Um, because in the end, whatever you develop has got to be sold on and... and mm people have got to occupy it. I think the, the huge change over the past couple of years, and I very much agree with Nigel Rawlings on this, the huge change over the last couple of years is that um, every kind of investor is now taking um, ESG sustainability seriously. Mm. Um, and uh, the, the, there are, I mean, the other thing is that there really are no climate sceptics now. There are people who prefer to put things off and not do things, of course. Um, and, but, the, but even they have to say, well, climate change is happening. And the fact is that the pressures every year become greater because that's the nature of climate change. It comes mm. closer to home. So uh, m my view is that there really isn't a place for somebody who's second best we really do have to be building everything today everything new today mm. it's got to be built so that it fits in with um, um net zero um and i don't think that is going to be other than that because the the occupants too are having to write in their annual reports what 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 they think of this and and uh, of course it, if you have to do that then there's an absolutely no doubt that uh, um, you're not going to you're not going to say well i've saved you all a lot of money by by renting a accommodation which is crap i mean you're not going to win this battle so so no. I, I don't think there can be a two tier one the only thing we really do have to do is to make sure that um, that investors have the mechanisms of being able to make the right judgments. And that means a much better transparency between developers and builders and, and, uh, and investors. And that those same rules become uh, and the same uh, information uh, becomes a necessary part of the availability to people when they come to rent accommodation. Um, because very often uh, we don't have quite the same um, uh, transparency when it comes to the person who, who's trying to let the building with the person who's hiring it. And we do need to have a, 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 a very much better operation on, on that front. And I really do think, you know, people like Peel who are actually trying to do the thing properly and, 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 and Nigel trying to do things properly, they must have a benefit from that. And the only yes. way you get a benefit from it is that people know that if you go to this building, you are actually going to have lower overheads because that's the nature of it you're going to have a better deal and what's more you're going to be able to say to people that we are in tune with what our principles are which is to make climate to, to, to meet uh, net zero uh, by whatever date they fixed mm. that means transparency indeed Nigel do you want to add uh, yes it's, it's very straightforward valuers will start downvaluing buildings mm -hmm. that don't uh, have renewable heating or, or 
green elements to them <clears throat> and will um, enhance the values of those that do. And I agreed with Lord Devon that very much on the um, occupier market, the, the same is true. What we found in the past with district heating systems is that it, it may take a full winter, but then our residents realize that their heating is cheaper and more efficient. And they realize that they are they're receiving a benefit there. It, it's difficult at first when they come into the building, but subsequently uh, after a full winter, and I've actually given people, you know, guarantees. If you compare your bills at the end of the winter with an average yes. electricity tariff, then um, and you'll find that we've overpriced in any way, shape, or form. We'll refund you, and we've we've never had to do that. We're okay. looking at district heating systems in Wolverhampton, where we're initially going to be running our district heating system on ninety five apartments on biomass, but then the heat network infrastructure for the city of Wolverhampton is going to go past the gable end of our will building so we'll turn off our biomass boilers and hook up to the energy from wasteland same thing in leeds we're paying three quarters of a million there to have the leeds pipe network extended to a building that we're, that we're <clears throat> planning to develop there so that and we've worked all the figures out as well as the occupiers benefiting from living in a sustainable building with renewable energy they will benefit from lower costs and we've all seen the way that uh, uh wholesale energy prices from the grid are, are rising rapidly at the moment mm -hmm. Yeah. Mike, do you want to add to that? Just just a quick point around zero carbon new build. One of our experiences in developing the Manchester zero carbon new build standard is actually surprised there is not a clearly established what do we mean by zero carbon new build. Mm. Um, we've worked with Green Building Council, we've worked with some of the great sort of developers and advisors in Manchester, and we've had to develop what we call the Manchester zero carbon new build standard. That's because we haven't got an alternative. I was talking, we had the Conservative Party at the um, Conservative Party Conference and talking there to a number of MPs trying to get the case for there being a proper national zero carbon new bill standard. We, it can't be right that individual districts, authorities have to have their own standard. We need a national standard and that allows that level playing field that both uh, Lord Deben and Nigel have been talking about. Mm. Yeah, Joe, do you want to add? Yeah, and, and I suppose in terms of investors, um, there's a really great piece of uh, research done by Adelshaw Goddard recently, um, um, basically showing that investors will be investing for the next few years, but by 2025, they won't be. <laughs> so yeah. if you like, I, I, that's how I see the two tier. At the moment, you can get finance. And by 2025, you won't be able to get finance. So we're absolutely building for the future. We're building for the, the needs and wants of our, our future customers. Um, so absolutely, we, we're not going to be building stranded assets, are we? We're going to be, be building in and making sure that we can continue to, to get the finance that we need. And at the moment, there's, there's so much out there in terms of um, sustainability linked loans and green loans. Um, but and, and you can have a sort of your USP, you can get a preferential rate on that at the moment but yeah. i i really see that as the interim and by 2025 it's it's going to be more about actually we're not going to give you the finance if if you're you're not already doing um, and engaged in all of this mm -hmm. no that all, all very valid but um we kind of skirted on it but uh, i sort of asked the question directly in terms of how the partnership between the public and the private sector can ensure sustainable delivery um with your your work in in Stockport, Nigel, is this? I mean, this is was this something that was key to your choice of 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 um, uh, developing, say, the mailbox? Um, well, the planners in Stockport had an influence in that they uh, encouraged us to extend the or increase the extent of living wall on the building. I think where the public sector. Actually, the public sector have been ahead of the private sector to a large extent. So registered providers have been more active in and more focused on the likes of district heating systems in the north of England than the private sector. Um, so I think in some ways the public sector have taken a lead. I also think that using 
um, funds like the Brownfield Housing Fund or Homes England funding and making sure that's directed to uh, buildings that are sustainable or use renewable energy, et cetera, will, will be very helpful. It's evident there's a lot of buildings being built in Manchester that haven't had that catalyst or drive for uh, renewable energy, for example. Um, and I think that might have to come from uh, legislation and grant support as well. Yeah, Mike. Just to say, I think um, Manchester and Greater Manchester have a great track record of that partnership between public and mm -hmm. private sector. And I think a lot of the sort of magic that's happened in Greater Manchester over the last um, 20 years has come from that mm -hmm. collaboration. I just want to draw out one of the announcements that a really welcome announcement came out, I think it was yesterday, about the hi um, HiNet and the funding for high net and hydrogen in the northwest of England. And I think that really strikes out to me and, and sort of picking up on Nigel's point about the balance between the two, because the high net is very much a business led collaboration um, across businesses who are the major emitters, the major consumers of energy across the northwest, working together to work with the private public sector to get the funding to make that happen. So I think there is places where there is public sector led, but I think there are also places across the northwest of England where that collaboration is being private sector led, but then working with a with a public sector who are really keen and supportive of making those things happen. Mm. No, interesting. Um, uh, we, we've kind of touched on this a little bit, but um, users, users of the places and spaces that we're talking about here and their demand for sustainable development is, is obviously very high. Um, and how much, how much do you think their part is in, how significant is their part in assisting us to push that agenda forward? That makes sense, yeah. I'll take that one if you like to start. Okay, Joe, thanks. Um, I think it's it's all about we're, we're trying to build climate resilient communities, mm -hmm. and absolutely, if we don't listen to the people who are living there, working there, coming to visit, um, we're you know we might as well pack up and go home. It's all about the places and the destinations, and and making sure that they're they're fit for the people who 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 want to use them. Um, so I, th I think, you know, we're entering a new era in that in terms of our stakeholder engagement with people and really understanding what, what their future needs are. Um, for example, at a place like uh, Media City in Salford, um, which is just 10 years old um, now, um, we, you know, we've seen, we started that as, a, as a Bri the first Briam community in 2011 in the UK. Uh, now, 10 years on, it's a fully operational site, uh, employs 7,000 people. Uh, it's the home to the BBC North. Um, and if we don't keep responding to, to the people who live and work there, then it won't evolve and it, it won't continue to be the place that everybody wants to come to in, in Salford. Um, mm. So we really have to keep our finger on the button in terms of knowing what, what the looking at the, the future um, trajectory is for people. We're getting, we're personally, you know, getting so many more uh, queries from, from our occupiers about what, about the specific building they're in. You know, is it net zero carbon? What's the energy use? What's the water use, et cetera. Um, but also bringing the community along with it as well and making sure that it's not just about the buildings, whether they're residential or commercial real estate, it's about the places in between the buildings as well. Uh, it's about the public realm and and remembering you know especially now post pandemic it's very much about people's health and well-being indoors as well as outdoors and and in that, that communal public space between the buildings and making sure we're, we're making that fit for people as well and what what people's aspirations are yes okay thank you joe so um before i sort of ask the the floor for a final question just to kind of wrap up on a few key points from today we've sort of we have whilst we've heard that we're not necessarily reducing enough uh we have you know we, we're aware that there are a number of issues uh or, or initiatives in place in terms of um laws and legislation the the, the green deal that lord uh Deben so mentioned there, there's a huge amount of input impetus needed still for um the retrofitting of housing and and the potential capital cost of that but there are initiatives out there interesting to hear about the development of skills that's happening in Bolton 
we touched on the, the, the idea that we need to build the timber industry in the UK, um, but timber isn't the only solution there. Uh, the, the, you know, we need to, to consider sort of greening the other materials that we use for construction. Um, that we need to design and build for uh, the long-term net to zero aspiration, um, that valuers will downvalue those buildings that don't meet with those credentials. Um, and that uh, we're building for sustainable communities at the end of the day, and that's our long-term aim and goal. But we heard earlier from Nigel and his aspirations of, of a new technology uh, and the application of that in the River Mersey. I just wanted to ask um, Joe and Mike and, and uh, Lord Deben, um, what inventions or technologies that you may already know about that aren't necessarily mainstream or something that maybe is an idea in your own heads that one day will come to play its part in greening our economy, greening our environments and greening our, our lives. Um, Joe, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I don't want to give anything away. You know, I might as well go for the Earthshot prize or something. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I think I think if it's if it's about technology, I mean, it needs to be pretty much the near future in terms of its application. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to have something near future combined with a, um, a, a sort of a, a war mentality to, to get on and do it and do it now. Um, the one thing that's very interesting to me is the, the applications of graphene in the, in the built environment. Uh, I think the near future is some really exciting you know, research coming out of the University of Manchester in terms of batteries and use in concrete uh, to, to help decarbonise our sort of near future um, society. Yeah, thank you. Um, Mike, do you have any thoughts on it? Um, I actually take your point about near future, and I think most of the technology we are going to adopt is already out there. We've just got to learn how to deploy it. Um, I would say the one area of new, and it's, it's, it, I'll, I'll go back to my theme of retrofit again, as we go through, say, uh, half a million houses in Greater Manchester doing retrofit, making that as smooth and as efficient as we can was going to be really important to drive down the cost. And there's a real role I think we can digital can play in that, that we have really efficient systems that get people in the right place in the right houses with the right equipment at the right time to implement those sorts of things. So it's not particularly exciting new um, technology, but using the power of digital to be really efficient in our um, retrofit programme, I think it's got a huge role to play in making a difference. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Lord Deben, you, do you have any thoughts well, on I've got, the future? I, I've got one which is really not technological at all, and that is that, I mean, we've just got to learn to be better at communicating what we're trying to do to the people who feel that we're trying to do it to them. Um, and we just are very bad at that. And, and I, I think that we sometimes make jokes about uh, the British dependence on, on uh, the... Um, uh, arts degrees. I mean, we, we really ought to use these people who are supposed to be doing arts degrees to, to be better at communication. I banned the words um, uh, 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 kilowatt hours from the Climate Change Committee because I don't think anybody knows what a kilowatt hour is <laughs> and I don't think you can feel it or touch it. So you've got to talk about bills. We've got to talk better. About it. The other thing is really not about regeneration, but uh, all, all our towns are surrounded by, uh, by countryside. And the, the big changes which I'm looking to are the most remarkable changes, which mean that we will be able to, to plant without pesticides and, and, and herbicides, because um, the new robot equipment, which will run on electricity, will in fact be able to distinguish between the plants and the weeds and be able to actually pick the weeds out. Now, just think what that means in terms of so much that we can do and what it means in the green spaces in our cities, because we'll be able to look after them much more effectively and we won't be poisoning the earth in the way we are up to now so that's the area that I have been most fascinated by it is happening it's real today and but it's being developed now so that it will be lighter and therefore be able to be ele electrified and think what that means to farms and the removal of, uh, of of diesel from farms it will be a very very exciting change indeed no that's fantastic um so Simon back over to you thank you everybody there um for that uh, discussion and debate uh, thank you very much. Um, that was absolutely fascinating. So thank you to Lord Deven, to Joe, to Mike, 
Nigel, uh, and of course uh, to our fabulous chair today, Helen. Um, I'm very excited by the uh, the machine that can decipher between a a healthy plant and a weed. I think I need one of those in my garden. I think that sounds most <laughs> useful. Um, anyway, d d I digress. Um, I, I, how do I summarise on today's event? It's, it's very tough, but Helen provides a fabulous summary. So I'm not I'm not going to go into detail again. But thank you thank you for that summary, Helen. It's, it saved me a job, and and uh, it's it's a very good summary to to decipher. The, the the broad ranging and in depth topic that's being discussed today. But it, one thing I would like to say is it's great to see such passion from everyone involved today. Um, but it's also equally reassuring that there are plans in place to match that passion. And I suppose one without the other, these changes, sorry, these challenging targets and aspirations will, will be even harder to meet. Uh, but it's it's great to see that the leaders in, in industry and, and indeed in our industry um, are so in tune with, with what's needed to be done. It's, uh, it's very reassuring, but thank you very much for, your, for all your time today. Uh, today's session has been absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm.